Hi, I'm Dr. Molly Gebrian, and you are watching part two in this series on variable practice. So in the first part, we talked about how variable practice, varying what you do when you're practicing, seems to be better than constant practice, just trying to do it exactly the same way every time. But not always, not all studies have found that variable practice is better. So how are you supposed to use this in your practicing if it's sometimes better and sometimes not? So the first study that we're going to look at to try to tease apart what's going on here is another beanbag study. If you didn't watch the first part, go watch the first part so you know what I'm talking about. In this beanbag study, they had four groups. So it wasn't a constant group and a, and a variable group. It was four different groups. One of the groups threw beanbags that were the same weight every single time. Another group had different weight beanbags every time. So every time they threw, the beanbag was a different weight. Group three had a different weight beanbag every six times. So they'd get the same weight for six throws and then they'd get a new weight for six throws and so on. And then the last group, they had a new weight every three throws. So they'd get three throws at one weight and then they'd have to switch weights. The testing situation for this study was having to throw two new weight beanbags that nobody had trained with. But those new weight beanbags were closest in weight to what the constant group practice with. So they were trying to give them an advantage, right? They practiced with this weight and the testing weights were close to what they did and not as close to what the other groups did. This graph is showing the results of the test. So where it says no KR, that is the testing situation. This graph is showing number of mistakes. So the lower the better. And you can see that the group that did a new weight every three throws, they're called random blocked in this study, they are the ones that are making the fewest number of mistakes in the testing situation. And the experimenters in this study think they got that result because people were given a chance to correct their errors and learn from their mistakes, right? So you can imagine on the first throw, they didn't do very well at all. And so they learned from that. And on the second throw, they were closer. And then the third throw allowed them to solidify that. Like, okay, yeah, I know how to do this now. It seemed like getting six of the same weights in a row before switching was too many that people started going on autopilot because they were bored. They'd figured it out and they didn't have to do all six repetitions. Um, and when you go on autopilot and when you're bored, you're not paying attention as well. And so you don't learn as much. In another study looking at Frisbee, they cut out the constant group altogether because you know, a lot of these studies have shown that the constant group really does not do well. So now they're looking at testing um, this sort of sweet spot between variability and getting to correct your mistakes, some constant practice. So this study on Frisbee throwing took adults and kids because they wanted to see is there any difference in age with, with this variable thing. So half the adults and half the kids threw the Frisbees to a different distance every single time. The other half of the adults and the kids switched distances every nine throws. So they'd get nine throws to exactly the same distance and then they'd have to switch distances. In the test, they found that the group that switched every nine throws did a lot better than the people that were switching distances every single time. So this backs up that beanbag study we were just talking about with the, the variable distances, that people were given an opportunity to learn from their mistakes, reinforce their ability to throw at this new distance before they had to move on to a new one. Interestingly, the kids in the condition where they switched every single time, they did really badly. They did way worse than the adults in that condition. So it seems like that increased variability was especially bad for the kids. Speaking of kids, there's a really interesting study that used kids and was looking at timing skills. So this is really relevant to us as musicians, right? We have to deal with really, really precise timings and practicing to get our timing exactly right. So in this timing study with these kids, what the kids had to do was press a button that activated this series of lights lighting up. And then they had to press a second button right when the last light lit up. So they had to synchronize their second button press with the last light in this light series. And the light series could either go fast or slow. And they found that the slow version was harder for the kids in a pilot study they did. In the practice situation, there were four groups of kids. One group practiced only on the slow version. So the lights lighting up really slowly. Another group of kids practiced only in the fast version. So the lights lighting up really, really fast. A third group of kids 
practiced at four different speeds. So the fast one, the slow one, and then a slower one and a faster one. And they switched speeds every time. So every time they pressed that button, the lights would go in a different speed. And then the last group, they also practiced at the four different speeds, but they got a new speed after every six times. In the testing situation, everybody had to do two new speeds that nobody had trained on, a slow one and a fast one, but the speed wasn't exactly the same as any of the versions anybody had trained on. So just like the beanbag study with the different weights that we talked about, the last group did the best, the one that trained on four different speeds, but they had six tries on each speed before they would move on to the new speed. Interestingly, the group that did the second best was the group that trained on the slow speed only. So a constant group. But remember, the slow speed is the hardest for the kids. So the group that did the best was the variable practice group. The second best group was the group that trained in the hardest version only. So that's really interesting. So what does all this mean? <laughs> like, how are we supposed to put this together to practice? So what all of these studies come to in their conclusion is that when your skill level is low, you want to have low variability in your practice. So remember the, in the Frisbee study, the kids that had a different throwing distance every single time did way worse than the adults who had a different throwing distance every single time. Presumably the adults were better at throwing the Frisbee to begin with than the kids. So when your skill level is low, there's already a lot of variability in what you're doing by nature of the fact that you're not very good at it. So if you introduce even more variability, it's just gonna make it too hard for you. But if you're at a higher skill level, you want high variability in your practicing because that will challenge you more. So how much variability, whether you have variability at all, depends on your skill level at the moment for whatever you're doing. This relates to the concept of the challenge point. So people that study learning and expert um, ability and whatever, there's this concept of the challenge point, which basically says your optimal place for learning is where it's not too easy and not too hard. You have to hit that sweet spot. But where that sweet spot is depends on your ability level. So hopefully you have an idea now of what this research shows. So it definitely does not say variability is always better. It depends on your skill level. But let's say you do want to introduce variability into your practice because you're at a high skill level and from this you understand, okay, I should be trying to vary things rather than doing it exactly the same every time. What are some ways to use this in practicing? That's what we're gonna talk about in part three.